Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on gender in early childhood education. A few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience any technical difficulties, um, please message the host using the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. During the webinar, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. Um, and as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded um, to be made available following the event. Please share your questions um, you may have for the panelists by using the chat window, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And all the information um, I've shared will also um, be posted in the chat window. So my name is Nicole Haberland. Um, I'll be your moderator today. I'm a senior associate at the Population Council and director of the Evidence for Gender and Education Resource Program, or EAGER. Early childhood education can bring substantial benefits to children by improving socio-emotional development and school readiness, and benefits can last a lifetime. Following the sustainable development goal of universal coverage at least one, of at least one year of preschool education, increasingly, more low and middle income country governments are planning for or implementing early childhood education programs. And this is great progress. However, principles of equity and inclusion are often not fully embedded in these policies or their practice. So today we'll have three presentations um, and a reflection to discuss gender equity issues in access and within the early childhood education environment. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Um, the first presentation will be given by Norma Rao on the importance of early childhood education in low and middle income countries. Normala is professor in early childhood development and education, chair professor of child development and education, and director of the Consortium for Research on Early Childhood Development and Education, or CORE, at the University of Hong Kong. She's a developmental and educational psychologist, internationally recognized for her research on early childhood development and education in Asian cultural contexts. Her research has focused on the development, evaluation, and dissemination of evidence-based programs. Her work is underpinned by the belief that empirical research should inform education and social policy regarding, regarding children and their families, and by a commitment to equity, particularly in relation to access to education for children who are disadvantaged. Next, Samyukta Subramanian will speak about gender-responsive pedagogy. Samyukta is co-head of Prathom's Early Years Program. She leads early childhood education and early grade programs across multiple Indian states and has extensive experience working with government officials, private sector partners, and nonprofit leaders to develop and implement education initiatives. Her focus has been on India's pre-primary education landscape and improving ECE outcomes at scale. She's also an Echidna Global Scholars alum at Brookings. There, her research focused on India's early childhood education policy, examining lessons for gender transformative early childhood in India. And last but not least, um, Arindam Nandi will present findings from a study in India that looked at the gender gaps in preschool enrollment. Arundam is an economist at the Population Council. His research covers multiple disciplines, including health economics, development economics, and demography. His research at the Council focuses on education and health, including the relationship between early life conditions and schooling outcomes, long-term and intergenerational benefits of education, and the interaction between socioeconomic factors, gender, health, schooling, and cognitive development. And after the presentations, Dana Schmidt will share insights and reflect on what has been presented. Dana is program director for Echidna Giving, a private funder supporting the best ways to educate girls in lower income countries so they can create positive ripple effects in their family, communities, and nations. In addition to other roles, Dana has led in developing Echidna Giving's strategy for early childhood development and building out the ECD grant portfolio in India, East Africa, and beyond. Following Dana, we'll have a Q&A session to provide you an opportunity to ask questions. We'll then wrap up with some closing remarks. And now with a warm welcome to our speakers, I'd like to turn over the webinar to our first presenter, Nirmala Rao. Thank you, Nirmala. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for that very kind introduction. I'm just waiting to get the um, meeting controls and we can start. 
Okay, I have a, sorry, I have a very nice topic to talk about today. And the title of my uh, talk is Nourishing Young Minds. And I'm, as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the importance of early childhood education in low and middle income countries. I'm going to talk about uh, the evidence base for early investment, uh, the increasing global commitment to early childhood care and education, and the uh, positive trends we see in moving towards high quality, inclusive early childhood care and education systems in different parts of the world. So uh, we have three st strands of evidence that make it imperative that we invest in early childhood education. The first strand of evidence comes from neuroscience. So we know uh, brain development is very rapid in the early years of life. And if you can see in the top right part of the, the slide, uh, we can see neuronal development. And you can see how rapid it is um, in from newborn to two years of age. And there's not as much rapid development, as much difference between two-year-olds and um, adults. So synapses are formed and they operate on a use it or lose it basis. If you look on the left side, you can see uh, development um, of different parts uh, of the brain and you can see that it's very rapid in the early years. The, the other um, slide at the bottom right, it shows the brain of a child with normal development and a child who's experienced extreme neglect. Um, there were studies done after the Ceausescu regime collapsed in Romania. There were children who were in orphanages and we uh, re the research showed that children who were um, adopted early were able to recover. Okay, so that is shows the neuroplasticity. So what we see is neglect affects the brain size because of toxic stress, but also children can recover uh, if they're provided stimulating environments. The other argument for investment in the early years, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is the economic argument. We know from... Uh, very famous studies, including the Perry Preschool and the Ab Abecedarian Project in the United States, the Jamaica Project in the West Indies, that when we invest in early childhood education, we have higher returns on our investment um, than we if we invested later in childhood or in adulthood. But what tends to happen is governments tend to invest later in schooling, not in the early years. So this is the famous Heckman curve that shows the returns to investment uh, when made at different times in the lifespan. The other argument um, for investing in the early years comes from developmental and educational sciences. And there've been uh, a number of meta-analysis and systematic reviews that show that one, attending early childhood education programs has benefits for children in terms of their cognitive development, their social development, their language development. And the evidence base was initially quite small in low income countries, but now it is um, increasing in size. So we know that children who attend school uh, do better than those who don't, who attend preschool. We also know that quality of this experience matters much for development. In addition to these three strands of evidence, uh, we have the rights-based argument as investment in the early years is seen as a way to promote social justice uh, because it can break the cycle of inequity that are uh, experienced by millions of children around the world. So early childhood intervention uh, has supported a policy focus on equality of educational opportunity. We know uh, from research that ECE, ECCE has a positive influence on children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Okay, we talk about the compensatory effect of early childhood education. We also know that early childhood education is lauded for 
not leaving children, disadvantaged children behind at the starting gate of school. This graph show is actually from the US National Kindergarten Longitudinal Study, but it shows socioeconomic gradients. At the beginning of school, children from high socioeconomic uh, status families are much ahead than their, uh, at, than their uh, peers who are from socially disadvantaged families, and there is a gradient relationship. Early childhood education also is lauded for being a powerful, sorry, uh, being a powerful equalizer. So why should we invest early? We also should invest early to, pre to prepare children for the future, the changing nature of work and changing society. Some of you in the audience may not have seen some of these uh, icons before, typewriter, a rotary phone. We have gone from this to this, right? So what we talk about learning to learn, approaches to learning, we need to prepare our youngest citizens for the change, for changing society. We also have to deal with demographic changes. We know we have an aging society. And we uh, research has shown that children who attend early childhood programs show benefits later in life, even at age 15 in the program of international student achievement studies. Okay. We've seen, uh, I'm mindful of the time, we have, um, we have a number of international commitments towards early childhood education, right from the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child to the World Declaration on Education for All. The John Tan Conference was really a, um, a watershed moment for us because at that time they said, learning begins at birth. It doesn't begin when children start school, it begins at birth. Then we've had the Dakar Framework of Action, the Moscow Conference, uh, the Educational uh, Agenda 2030, and most recently, the World Conference on Early Childhood Care and Education in Tashkent. And all these international commitments recognize the importance of early childhood education. The Lancet series um, on advancing early childhood development from science to scale introduced the concept of nurturing care, which is been really important, which is guiding policies in low and middle income countries. And nurturing care um, comprises of five elements that children need to thrive, including um, nutrition, health care, security and safety, responsive caregiving, and opportunities for early learning. Nurturing care refers to the, to, uh, to the policy environments that help children to thrive. Um, SDG target 4.2 states that by 2030, we need to ensure that all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development care and primary education so that they are ready for primary school. And what we know is that ho both homes and preschools affect child outcomes. Uh, and we need to ensure that all children, regardless of where they live, experience stimulating home environments and benefit from early childhood education. We also know that education policy makes a difference for children's outcomes. I'm sharing some data here from UNICEF's mix uh, surveys that uh, on the left, you have home learning environment or home learning activities. Um, and what you see uh, is that the more educated mothers are, the more in home learning activities they provide children, such as reading to children, uh, taking them out. So we see this gradient relationship between maternal education and the experience that children have in the homes. We see these in a gradient relationship between maternal education and early child outcomes. We also see that the more mothers have in terms of education, um, they also uh, are more likely to send their children to preschool. Oh, sorry, I'm not able to advance the slide. My time is up. <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, I need to wrap up a participation in early childhood 
care and education has increased. Uh, the, the top line shows high income countries, but it's still low in low income countries. And also, whoops, my slide isn't advancing. Sorry about that. We know that educational policy is critical. We're concerned with access and equity, availability, adaptability, and affordability. Thank you very much. And if I can now request Samyutta to uh, give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nirmala. Um, I'm going to wait for my slides to come up. And as I begin, um, Nirmala talked about the importance of investing early and on early childhood education and development. I'm going to make a case to say not only do we need to invest early, we also need to be looking at the early years with a gender lens. Um, we know that a lot of work has happened with older children, um, uh, but I want to say that all of the work that we do in later years um, could actually begin in the early years so that what we do is preventive and not always curative. Um, if we do this in the early years, um, I think uh, we would see lasting change for the generations to come. Uh, so as I begin, uh, the roots of the perceived inequalities between boys and girls, um, we know begin early. Uh, we know that gender identities are formed uh, early in life by about two and a half years. We know that uh, uh, many children begin to form perceptions about each other's intelligence before the age of six. And so we find a lot of the stereotypes, the beliefs, the understanding of each other uh, uh, that children are forming are actually beginning in the early years. What we see in later years is perhaps a manifestation of uh, what has already begun in the early years. Um, I just want to uh, share an example from uh, a class. Uh, just a second. I'm not able to move my screen. I'll try. Otherwise, Sherry, I may need your help to move it. Um, okay. Yep. Uh, okay. I have my screen. Thank you. Um, so the example I wanted to share with you was I was in a class and uh, little this little child, she was about four years old. And she was uh, drawing this uh, picture of a cup. And my colleague who was with me, a male colleague, he said, oh God, I have so many cups that I need to wash when I get home. And uh, this little girl, Vedika, she started laughing. Um, and she said, uh, and I said, why are you laughing? Like he has a lot of work when he goes home. And uh, she said, boys don't wash dishes. And I was in shock. I was like, what does that mean? And my friend was like, I wish. Um, and then we looked at him and he said, no, but this boy washes dishes. And you know what? He's He cooks really well. And I could see this expression of shock on her face where she was like, I didn't even know that's possible. Um, so just I, I just want to share this because this is a real example where I went into shock when I heard this child saying this. And um, now we have research that backs this up, that all the stereotypes, all the beliefs, uh, that we see in later years, we actually see beginning to form in the early years. Uh, we also see that this, these beliefs, these stereotypes are a result of life experiences, people around us, and many of these beliefs at home reinforce what happens in class. Uh, sometimes these mistaken beliefs in class reinforce what happens at home. And so it's very important to begin to look at everything that we do in the early years with children with a gender lens. And so if we want to do this in the early years, how do we do it? We need to look at everyone who's around the children, the parents, the teacher, the community in which children live. Um, and of course, all the content which we are either planning for or which may be happening spontaneously in the community. Um, we know that parents, especially the mother, spends maximum time with children 
um, uh, at this age. Uh, we have preschool teachers in India. We call the, the, the preschools that are run by the government, uh, we call them Anganwadis. We also have some preschools in schools, but the Anganwadis actually run in the community. Um, and our uh, children between age three to six actually attend these centers. Uh, these centers are also within communities. And so every 250 homes, you'll find a center like this. And then, of course, there's content that goes into the Anganwadi. That could be curricula, it could be materials, it could be instructions, and it could be a whole host of other things happening in class. And so uh, I want to say that while the children are at the center of this ecosystem, it's everyone around the children, everyone and everything that we need to be looking at with the gender lens. We need to see what are the kind of interactions happening between adults, because after all, at this age, children learn very quickly, as we already know, they imitate a lot and they begin to believe a lot of things that are happening um, around them. So at Pratham, I work with a not-for-profit which works in education and I'm with, I, I'm with the early years. So at Pratham, what we started to do was we said, let, if we have, uh, we are working in the early childhood education space, then how do we support all these stakeholders in the ecosystem and how do we begin to have a gender responsive pedagogy around it? And so uh, uh, we began by saying we need to work with teachers, but also communities, mothers in the communities. We need to look at the uh, content that is going in. And of course, others, volunteers and others who actually live in that community um, in order to begin to bring about a change. Um, and so one of the first things we focused on was uh, were teachers and mothers. Uh, with teachers, like our Anganwadi teachers, we went through our Pratham uh, 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 program leads in this area. This is in Patna, Bihar, and uh, there's another city, Delhi. We worked in these two places and in Patna with about 100 Anganwadis. Um, we worked with our own teams there who look after these Anganwadi centers. A lot of capacity building there to not only talk about early childhood education, but to begin by talking with our own teams about their experiences with respect to gender and how they see it, building the vocabulary around it, the understanding and awareness around gender, how is it different from sex, how does it affect both girls and boys. And also then connecting it with the kind of content that we see around us. For example, the poems, the stories, the games, the interactions, everything that happens in class. Uh, if we were to begin to look at all of this with a gender lens, how would it look? Does it work? Does it need changing? And if it needs changing, then within your context, how do we bring about that change? Our conversations and workshops were around this with our own teams and then with those who were teaching at the centers. Outside the class, we felt that it was important to also begin working with mothers. And so we created mothers groups. Uh, so in a little neighborhood, in a hamlet, you could have a few mothers coming together for about half an hour every week. And we would share with them books and content on tablets and also many, uh, many stories and conversations that mothers would have with each other. And we began to influence this too through our Pratham teams. And in order to do this, uh, because uh, in terms of training, we could impart the training, but we also needed to look at what kind of content goes into the class or goes into the community that may also need a relook. Um, and so we began by looking at everything that was out there. We looked at books, we looked at curricula, we looked at digital games, and we also looked at uh, 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 lots of poems that we use with children. Um, and so we tried to understand, you know, not only uh, uh, the character, so we would look out, of course, for, uh, you know, children and adults in all these uh, different kinds of uh, media, but we would not only look at the representation of uh, characters, but we would also look at the role that they seem to be playing. So, for instance, you could have equal representation between men and women, boys and girls, but often we found that the fathers, while they were there in the storybook, they may not have a caring role. Maybe the father looks a little harsh, a little distant, or maybe he is absent from the, the story. The mother often looks uh, uh, like she's very caring, she's providing the food. Uh, in terms of professions, there are certain professions that maybe the mother has uh, or holds, whereas the father doesn't. In case of animal characters, looking at are there some male and female characteristics that these uh, characters have? 
And then are they also playing into that gender stereotype? Even though we see them as uh, what we call anthropomorphic characters, they may imbue some of this um, as well. Uh, in terms of digital games, we realize that a lot is a lot revolves around the kind of illustrations and pictures that they are, there are. And so we created like an analysis tool, a checklist to see and put all this content through this uh, sort of a review. We also gave it to our teams and our teams then said, we need to make these kind of changes. And they felt very strongly about what could actually change in class and in conversations with mothers. What kind of books should actually go ahead and be shared with mothers? And so in the next step, we what we tried to do was find and create content that we think would really work. Where are those inspirational stories? Where are those role models? What are those conversations? What kind of roles are people playing? Either we find it or we create it. And we need to create it within the context in which we are. And so uh, in order to create it, we, uh, uh, we started to look at the kind of books that were out there. So we curated it and we also distributed it. But we also created some digital games. And um, I just want to share a short video with you around um, the sort of game we created. I am trying to move my screen, but I think I'm not able to move it. Sherry, if you can help me. I need, yes, thank you. So these are some of the pictures we created. And here are some of the stories. Um, uh, we also curated from other publications. And then we this opened out conversations in mothers groups because suddenly they were looking at a lot of stories that either they resonated with or it opened up a lot of points for discussion. Uh, the checklist, I can see this question on chat, so I want to answer it right away. Yes, we created a checklist and we found that it was quite tough for our teams. And so our teams then contextualized it and made it much simpler. I'm happy to share it, but uh, remember our teams on the ground who know the context well are better positioned to a sort of fine tune it. Uh, in terms of the digital games, as I was sharing, uh, we created a few uh, and I just want to share a little video around it. Um, let me see if it plays. Uh, From an early age, girls and boys receive messages that they should look, behave and aspire to do different things according to their gender. This leads to them absorbing strong beliefs about what they can and cannot do. Pratham has created new digital games for children in preschool and early grades. These games look at different themes like professions, shapes, emotions, and celebration. But they all have a core message. Your gender should not restrict what you want to do and how you want to be. The aim of these games is to encourage conversations between children and their parents and among children through asking questions about what children are seeing, hearing, and thinking. बता कब लगता है डर मैं हैप्पी रोने की आवाज आती है ना जब डर लगता है रोने की आवाज हां ये भूत की आवाज आती है नहीं पापा दीस गेम्स आर अवेलेबल फॉर फ्री ऑन प्रथम ओपन स्कूल एंड प्रोडजी फॉर लाइफ अ मोबाइल ऐप अवेलेबल ऑन एंड्राइड डिवाइसेस थैंक यू so with that, I'll end my um, presentation. From just to share that here, um, we have, um, just to share that here, this is an example of a game age, that can open and conversations boys between parents message. and children. Um, and uh, being gender responsive means looking actively at everyone around you and the conversations that people are having and the content that is created. Uh, thank you so much. And with that, I'll hand over to Arindam. Thank you, Samyukta. I'm just waiting for um, the slide to move. There we go. Uh, thank you. So this is a joint work with uh, um, co-authors at IIM Bangalore and the Population Council. Um, let me go <clears throat> right into gender gaps in education in India. Um, as we know, you know, through 
uh, strong educational policies in the last decade uh, or a little bit more than a decade, India has achieved universal enrollment rates in primary school both for both boys and girls. And enrollment rates are over 95% at this, at this time. Now, um, there is still a strong gender gap in terms of educational resources that are given to boys and girls. Um, typically, boys are enrolled in better quality private schools at higher rates than girls, and they are also given, you know, other educational resources. Uh, the, the, the households spend more money for uh, their teaching and pedagogical resources and so on. And as a result, through different levels of schooling, you would see that there is a very clear male bias gender gap in outcomes, and that is reflected in you know, completion rates at different levels, then standardized test scores, and even uh, the choice of major in college. And all of this comes from uh, a very well-known, well-documented preference for sons over daughters, um, which has been documented in India for, uh, you know, for close to a, um, a hundred years. Uh, because of the preference for sons over daughters, you see, um, you know, it, it being manifested through sex selection and then also lower human capital investment in girls. Let me go to the next slide. So let's talk about early childhood education in India. Um, as Samyukta was saying, <clears throat> India is one of the very few countries which uh, has a very large national program of early childhood education. Um, this is a program which started in 1975. Now it is uh, it has universal coverage. It's called the ICDS program or Anganwadi program. Um, what it does is uh, it's a, you know it's a comprehensive package uh, built around nutrition. So it is a program which runs from a center in each village. And then you have uh, daily supplemental nutrition that is given to young children, pregnant women and nursing mothers, and now adolescent girls as well. And um, um, besides the daily cooked meal, the program also provides um, <clears throat> a nutritional education to mothers, sometimes child immunization and health referral services as well. And there is a basic ECE component of the program as well. The quality can vary a lot across uh, different states and different regions. Now there's also a very strong um, private preschool market alongside ICDS and private preschools are available everywhere, both rural and urban areas, more so in our urban areas, uh, but typically private preschools are uh, sort of um, you know, a downward extension of formal schooling. So sometimes preschools would be you know, co-located with a primary school, um, and then the teaching, um, the pedagogy would be more formal, <clears throat> you know, trying to not focus so much on learning through playing, but you know, um, sort of an extension of uh, kindergarten or grade one type of teaching that you would see in private preschools. But um, the quality arguably can be better when you look at you know, literacy and numeracy outcomes of children. Um, private preschool enrolled children have better test scores than those going to government schools. And this, this has been shown by uh, several different studies. But overall, if you look at the, the learning outcomes of Indian children, there is a strong learning poverty um, you know, this is something that Pratham has documented very well through the annual survey of education report, annual status of education reports. 44% of grade five government school students can read grade two text and only 23% can do division. So um, if you think about early childhood education, there is a strong need for uh, doing high quality early childhood education program, both in private and government settings so that children are prepared to enroll in primary school when the time comes. Okay, um, these are some pictures from 
the ICDS program. Let's go into jump into the data that we use for our study. So the, so the idea for our study was to try and document what kind of gender gaps exist in uh, preschool enrollment and the choice of preschools, uh, public versus, versus private. So we sort of follow the path that has been shown by the, uh, the Assar report in 2018, uh, which was done for rural India. That report uh, did a comprehensive landscaping of uh, preschool education in India. And the report found that girls are more likely to be in government preschools, which is typically ICDS than, than boys. And uh, the report focused on the age group four to five years. But then the report also showed, which has been also document has been documented by other studies as well, that private preschool students are better in terms of their learning outcomes. Um, one of the um, limitations of the report is um, it is done for in only rural India, not urban India, which is about thirty percent of India, and it has higher enrollment in preschools than rural India. And then the estimates are sort of cross-sectional and summary statistics, not typically adjusted for background socioeconomic characteristics of the, of the households, of the families. And then we also don't know what happened because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So to answer some of these questions, what we did is we looked at the, the most recent DHS data set from India, which is known as the National Family Health Survey 2019, 2021. Um, it covers about 600,000 households. And for the first time, DHS in India collected data on preschool enrollment patterns for two to four year, two to four year old children. And we have a national, national representative data set of about 134,000 children of this age group. Um, we find in the data that about 40% children are enrolled and of them 28% are in private preschool. So um, using this data set, what we did is um, we comprehensively accounted for background characteristics um, and regional characteristics, um, including district level and state level as well. So um, we did a multivariate regression model. Um, it started from state and district fixed effects, and then we also did a household fixed effect model and mother fixed effect model. So for all of these models, um, we looked at two types of outcomes. One was preschool enrollment, a binary indicator of whether a child in that two to four year age group was enrolled or not of, in any type of preschool. And then for children who were enrolled, we also looked at the binary choice between whether they were going to a private preschool or whether they were going to a government, government preschool. Um, we accounted for a lot of different characteristics uh, of the child, including gender, age, birth order, nutritional status, and then mother's characteristics, household head's characteristics, and family characteristics as well, depending upon the type of model. Then we also um, you know, divided the sample into different types of different subsamples uh, by child characteristics, you know, by child age, mother's, mother's education level, uh, rural versus urban wealth group. And then it also did all of this by all the states. So we have, you know, nicely color coded state maps. If you go to the uh, the working paper that we have, all of this analysis for preschool enrollment as well as whether enrolled in a private preschool was done by different groups. So let's quickly summarize the main findings. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, so the main focus is, you know, what happens to girls as compared with boys. Um, as you can see, girls typically have an advantage in terms of preschool enrollment. So they typically are enrolled in preschools at a higher rate as compared with boys. And that is evident up until the mother fixed, fixed effect model. So when you look at, you know, within state, within district, within household, girls typically have an advantage. At the, house, at the mother level, when you're comparing siblings, that uh, advantage sort of goes away. It's still positive, but not statistically significantly different from uh, their, their brothers. Now let's go to the second column. And this is where it gets really interesting. Um, you see there consistently, there is a disadvantage for girls 
pearls in terms of getting enrolled in private preschool. So what we have seen for you know, other levels of education, uh, what we have seen in uh, primary schoolings, middle school, high school, and college, there is a consistent disadvantage for girls in terms of schooling quality choice. And that also shows up in uh, in preschooling uh, as well. So um, among two to four year old children who are enrolled in any preschool, girls are consistently enrolled uh, more in government preschools and less in private preschools. And that is even uh, present when you look at within the same households and between siblings. So um, the size actually effect size goes up when you look at siblings. It's the highest among siblings that girls are uh, less likely to go to private preschools as compared with their brothers. Um, next slide. So to summarize the effect size, uh, typically we see about 4%, girls are 4% more likely to be enrolled in any preschool. So there is an advantage in terms of getting enrolled in preschool, but you can clearly see that although girls are getting to preschool, they are sent more typically to the ICDS preschools and they are less likely about nine to 19%, depending upon the sample uh, that you're looking at, uh, they are less likely to go to private preschools as uh, as compared with boys. And now the rates of discrimination um, varies across subsamples. The highest gender gaps are typically seen among uneducated mothers and in rural areas. So what is our takeaway message from this? Um, should we have more private preschools? The answer is no. The answer should be you know, India has a very thriving, thriving national preschool program, the ICDS. So what we need to do is uh, improve the quality of the EC component of that ICDS program, because, you know, very clearly some states are doing really well. If you look at Andhra Pradesh, for example, uh, has a very strong thriving ICDS program with a strong EC component as well. Um, so, in some sense, you know, girls going to ICDS programs at higher rates than boys um, is something that we should leverage and we should make sure that, you know, we can build upon this current enrollment rate patterns and make sure that ICDS has a strong EC component, which is rolled out nationally. And that will mean providing more resources because one of the you know, main challenges of the ICDS program is uh, there's too much focus on nutrition. There's too much focus on you know, providing cooked meals, which is great because you know, we have done a lot of um, research on this and we know that the nutrition component can have really strong positive short-term and long-term benefits um, on the children who are enrolled in preschool uh, in, in, in the ICDS program. But we also do need to build upon uh, that program, the EC component of it, to make sure that, you know, eventually we get to what some of these states, Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Orissa are doing, which is integrating program, uh, the ICDS program with the primary school program as well. Right now, these two programs the, are under different ministries. So uh, the ICDS program is under the Ministry of um, Women and Child Development, whereas preschool uh, whereas primary schooling is under the Ministry of Education. So there's a need for coordinating different ministry efforts and making sure that you know the EC component does benefit from uh, what the Ministry of Education does. And sometimes these ITC, ICDS centers are now being co-located within the same campus as the primary school in the village. Um, and all of that can help in terms of you know, cross learning from the primary schools and improving the quality of teaching at the ICDS program. So with that, I'm going to close and hand it over to Dana. Great, thank you um, very much to all of the panelists for your presentations. Um, as many have already pointed out in the chat, this has been a really rich and informative set of presentations already. So. I am going to share what I see as three of the sort of key 
overarching takeaways from your presentations. Um, I, I think the first of this, uh, these takeaways is that early childhood is incredibly consequential. Um, my second key takeaway is that there are gender gaps in early childhood, even if they aren't talked about very much. Um, and my third key takeaway is that if we care about gender equity, then it makes a lot of sense to intervene in early childhood. Um, and so I want to sort of a little further elaborate a little bit on um, each of those three key points and perhaps even add a few additional dimensions to those three key points that haven't yet come up in the conversation. So in terms of this first point, early childhood is consequential. Um, so we heard very much from Nirmala about the um, key evidence from neuroscience, um, from economics in terms of the returns of early childhood, um, and from education in terms of the long-term effect on education outcomes of early childhood. Um, so really a, a key window for intervening for young children to set them off on a better path. Uh, and then we heard from Samyukta about um, how consequential early childhood is from the perspective of forming gender norms. So we heard that gender identities are formed by around two and a half years old, um, and that children have perceptions of how intelligent their peers are based on their gender by the time they're six years old. Um, so I think for all of those reasons, we already have a really strong sense of just how consequential early childhood is. But what we haven't yet touched on is the fact that it's not only being a child, being a young child that is really consequential, um, but having a child is also incredibly consequential. Um, and so I would argue that this period of early childhood is not only really critical for children themselves, um, but is also critical for their caretakers. Um, so if you think of a few examples, you know, getting pregnant um, can spell the end to education for many teenage girls. Um, when a new child um, enters a family that might constrict um, economic opportunities for many women, uh, a new sibling can, can mean that older sisters um, lose out on opportunities for education because they have more caretaking responsibilities for their younger siblings. Um, and perhaps on a more positive note, making the transition into parenthood is a moment when people's identities begin to shift, uh, which opens up the possibility that they can re-examine and perhaps even reshape um, their beliefs and norms in that, in that window of change. Um, so I, I, I suppose the argument I'm trying to make is that if we take a more expansive view of the consequences of early childhood, um, it would uh, even increase um, just how consequential this moment is um, and how influential investing in early childhood programs can be, not only for their children, but also for the women and girls who care for those young children. Um, I do think that means uh, expanding our views about what are the outcomes we're driving towards, um, because if we are so narrowly focused only on outcomes for children, we may miss the opportunity to have broader impact on families. Um, and if we're able to have broader impact on families, that will in turn amplify the impact we're able to have for young children. Um, so just maybe by way of one concrete example here, if we take a purely child-centric view of early childhood, uh, we might conclude it's important that children have exposure to, say, three hours of preschool learning opportunities a day. Um, but if we recognize that mothers or older sisters or whoever is caring for these young children remain uh, locked out of learning and earning opportunities because of their caretaking responsibilities, then we might instead decide to design our programs for eight hours of, of care in a day. Um, so, um, so this is a really critical window for young children. It's a really critical window for families and we can design programs that, that really amplify impact for both of them if we take into consideration everybody's needs. So that was the first the first key point, early childhood is, early childhood is consequential. Second key point, there are gender gaps in early childhood. Now, when I was first developing a kidney giving strategy around early childhood, um, uh, I had a lot of conversations and did a lot of research uh, in this space to understand how does gender show up in early childhood. 
And on the face of it, uh, actually, a lot of what you see is that there aren't big gender gaps in early childhood. Um, enrollment rates are largely equivalent. Uh, learning levels are largely equal. Uh, but I think when you dig a little deeper, as uh, our panelists point out, you begin to see some of the otherwise hidden gender gaps um, in, in early childhood. So as Arendam's presentation you know, really clearly shows, um, even if you have uh, equal or even advantaged enrollment for girls in preschools, you see that there's greater investment going into boys. Um, as Samyukta pointed out, there's also hidden inequalities in terms of the content and role modeling that children are receiving in those early years and in terms of what they then believe is possible or not possible to them because of their genders. This is another sort of hidden um, inequality. And um, I wanted to add two other uh, potential hidden gender gaps in early childhood to the mix. Um, so the first of those is that when you look at learning outcomes, one of the things that we see um, in some contexts is, is actually developmentally normal for girls to master some skills at younger ages than boys, um, that that learning trajectory looks different for girls versus boys. And what I have not seen is any analysis on outcomes um, for that adjust for those uh, potential developmental advantages. Um, and if we adjusted for them, would that actually mean that girls are developmentally behind? I don't I don't know. I haven't seen any analysis on that, but I think it would be quite interesting. And I'd be interested um, if the panelists have seen anything of that nature. Um, but the second dimension that I wanted to add as a as a potential hidden inequality in early childhood is that if you look at what early childhood programs um, require of caretakers, we might also be masking inequalities. So there are many programs out there to improve early childhood outcomes that rely on mothers doing more to support their children. Um, and this is incredibly pragmatic because mothers are often the primary caretaker, um, but is also potentially problematic insofar as it further entrenches the perception that mothers should be the, the ones taking care of children, that that's a woman's role and not a man's role. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is complicated because um, many programs that support parents uh, and their, to, to do better to support their young children's development actually um, give women stronger training and connections and community. And, and that process can be quite empowering for women. Um, and uh, furthermore, we don't want to sort of put women in a position where we're asking them to give up power over the domain of the household where they exert a lot of influence. But that said, I think we often think about ECD programs in ECD programming, we often think about mothers as instruments to the end of supporting their children, instead of thinking about how these programs can be designed in ways to maxly, maximally support those women themselves. So I'd love to hear from the panelists if, if we have a chance on uh, the, their thoughts on these other potential hidden dimensions to gender inequities in early childhood. And so then the last uh, point, uh, is, the third and final takeaway point is that if we care about gender equality, intervening in early childhood makes sense. Um, so I think this is very much the natural conclusion from the series of panelists um, that investing in early childhood is really critical, um, but unfortunately it's not happening enough. So if we look um, uh, for kind of overall investment in ECD, um, uh, there was a recent report from um, the Real Center and their world that found that aid to pre-primary education is uh, just 1.2% of education aid overall. Um, another report from UNICEF finds that in low-income countries, just 6.7% of funding for children goes to children who are under six years old. So we're investing too little uh, in young children. Um, and uh, I also took a look in the eager database, the evidence on gender and education resource, um, and uh, uh, found that only 14% of um, uh, the organizations cataloged in the eager database work in ECD versus something like 49% for an issue like life skills and 45% for literacy. So, um, so it's not an issue that gets a lot of attention within the girls' education community either. 
Um, so I would argue now is a time to sort of seize the opportunity and see um, how investing in the early years with a strong gender lens really offers us the opportunity to set both girls and boys up on a path to greater educational achievement, to shape more expansive notions of gender norms for young children, um, to invest in the caretakers of those young children who are very often women or girls, and to shift family norms around gender. So thank you all. I'm excited to hear what questions you have um, and, and grateful to be part of this panel. Thank you, Dana, um, for the really great um, reflections and elaborations. Um, I'm hoping we can um, ask some of the panelists their um, perspectives on those. But I wanted to um, turn to some of the questions that have been coming in through the chat. Um, and people can, should feel free to continue to insert questions. Um, one um, question from the audience um, for Samyukta um, was, well, the comment was, that was amazing. <laughs> it was. Um, what would you feel are the top three things we need to look at or change to be gender responsive in terms of content change? Yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yes, thanks, Nicole. Yes, I've been reading all the wonderful questions on chat. And I hope we get time to answer all of them. Um, I think the three, uh, that's a great question, the three top changes. Um, I was thinking in terms of content, uh, I think many of us already do this, but looking at illustrations, pictures, images, not just in content, but in our own presentations, in storybooks, in videos, things around us would be very useful. Um, the second would be around language, around the language we use the language we write in. And I think in every language, uh, there's potential to do more, uh, to change it around, uh, look at the characters we are using in our language. Uh, what are those characters doing? I think that would be very uh, interesting to see and also think about how can we think about it differently uh, to push the gender envelope on this. And third, but most important, I think it's very tough to build a script around what you can see and change so you need to actually build the capacity of people to be able to see anything around them with a lens. So I can't predict what will come in front of you, but if you have the capacity to have uh, to be able to see it, then A, you'll be able to do it in your context, in your language, in your, um, uh, in your uh, meeting or conference or classroom. Um, so it's not a script, but it is a tool that you will use if I build your capacity. And the second, I think, is sometimes it's not always possible to change everything around you, but you learn how to work around it if your capacity has been built. So you could have something which is very stereotypical, which you don't agree with in class, but then you need to have the language, the vocabulary, the capacity to be able to use that to open up conversations around gender equality. Yeah, so those are my top three. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, next question um, for Arundam. Um, do you think um, that the gender disparities in early education are due in any way to the birth ratio disparities? Or how would that factor in? Um, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to combine, so there are two questions I see. One is the gender disparity and birth ratio disparity, and then what are the differences between girls and boys among the working class in India? Um, so yes, so there is a very clear correlation. Obviously, uh, the birth ratio disparity is because of sex selection, as we know, um, which is manifested through you know selective abortions of uh, female fetuses and, and uh, also postnatal discrimination, which uh, is what we find here. Um, so these two are related, you know, it's a socio-economic and um, cultural background, um, which we have seen over a hundred years that there is a strong preference for sons over daughters. And because of which we see, you know, girls are given fewer resources, fewer educational resources at different levels of education. Um, um, for uh, preschooling, we saw a little bit of that in the ASAR 2018 report by Pratham, 
And now doing systematic analysis of the newest DHS data set, we find uh, similar outcomes. Um, so yes, both those two are highly correlated, uh, the birth ratio disparity and the gender gaps in uh, private preschool enrollment. Then the second is yes, um, the as we um, as I was touching uh, upon a, a very briefly in my presentation, we see a very clear gradient in terms of the gender gap in private preschool enrollment. Um, the discrimination against girls is higher in lower wealth quintiles and rural areas and among uneducated mothers, and it slowly disappears as you go. Um, to higher wealth quintiles. So among working class populations, uh, you would see girls being sent more likely to ICDS preschools, whereas boys are sent more uh, to private preschools. Thanks, Arndam. Um, another question that, that Dana raised, and I think is reflected in some of the, the questions here, is one that I, I always find quite um, compelling is the point that um, early childhood education also benefits mothers potentially. And um, I'm wondering, Nirmala and Arundam, um, if there is any evidence that would be useful, I don't know if it's from literature on young mothers or women's employment um, um, that, you know, that that really um, bolsters that angle. Um, and Nirmala, do you want to take it first? In our yeah. yeah, I uh, don't have figures, but uh, I have read that uh, when early childhood education is provided and like Dana was saying, you know, like having a whole day, it frees up mothers to engage in paid employment. So it uh, relieves them of their care caregiving responsibility a little bit. So many countries that have pronatal policy that want to actually increase birth rate, as you know, in many parts of the world, the birth rate is really falling a lot, not, not necessary, not in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia as yet, but many parts of East Asia. And what the governments are doing is providing free early childhood education, highly subsidized care. So one, it's increased encouraging parents to have children, but also um, allowing the mothers to work because if there's no one to take care of the kid, the the baby, um, you know, when the mother is working. So, so yes, absolutely. Um, there is a link between not, not only the freeing them of the caretaking responsibility, but women are getting much more educated today and they want to work. Uh, after having children. So this also enables them to, um, you know, uh, capitalize and use their education. So absolutely, it, it it's uh, helping gender, uh, particularly, uh, although some people, are, I mean, fathers are also important, but I'm just saying that typically the women uh, have the childcare responsibility. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. There is a you know fairly strong literature, large literature on the so-called motherhood wage penalty, um, and you know childcare policies, uh, free provision for childcare, and as Nirmala was mentioning, some of these uh, pronatal policies have clearly shown um, impact in terms of you know reducing the opportunity cost of childcare for mothers so that they can go back to the job market and have. Uh, productive employment again. Thanks both. Um, yeah, and then I, I think somebody also made a comment in the in the um, in the chat that this is also and Dana as well that you know this is also true of older sibling you know older siblings in terms of caregiving responsibilities that may fall on them and then hinder their own education. Um, um, there were a couple of questions. Um, I don't, not sure who would like to take these, um, but um, perhaps, um, perhaps some Yukta or uh, Nirmala. But what are your opinions about involving fathers and training more men in early 
care and education. Um, and then somebody else also said, I'd like to see suggestions for including fathers in the ECE discussion. I found them very important in my research on girls' education at the high school level. Um, so I'm wondering, um, maybe some Yukta, you could start us off with your on the ground experience. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, when we talk about boys and girls at this age, we're talking about all children. Um, and when we talk about adults, uh, uh, of course, we should be talking about fathers. And uh, in uh, there was another question, I think, around what did we find in our review? And we found that by children, you'll see multiple, uh, you will find equal representation. With the adults, you often don't see a father. And if you see a father, you may not see the father in a caring role, in a role where he or she, he's helping uh, in a caring role. Um, doing a few things inside the house. These were some things that we found uh, uh, were missing in our review. So absolutely, fathers should be involved in the conversation. The, uh, the only thing that I would say is how do we involve them in the conversation is something we need to think about. So for example, the children are quite often for a long time with the mothers. And yet it's important for fathers to understand because uh, whether it is children or adults, how do we interact with each other becomes very important in this discourse. So um, I think we need to think about, uh, and there are organizations, there are those who have already started work around this. How do we involve fathers? Um, at what stage, where, how do we depict them? How do we talk about them? I think all of that uh, should be part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with some of what Samyukta has said, but I want to take it one step further. I think it's much more than fathers. I think we need to have many more male early childhood teachers. I understand in many contexts it's not accepted, but, you know, it's it's growing, uh, you know, in, in many countries we do have. Them. So we need male role models as well. Gender Equality is about both boys and girls, and the early childhood curriculum in many, many countries is highly feminized. You you heard Samyukta talk about how they were changing, uh, you know, the, the books, the stories. So actually, when we talk about gender in early childhood education, we need to actually look at our curriculum as well. Um, you know, the, uh, the kind of story, you know, we say that more girls are going to preschool there do but the kind of like even books that we have in preschools are more like appealing to girls than to boys boys like more action adventure we know that girls tend to be better in literacy in the early years so i think this is one thing that we've not done well uh, in yet you know and it's not only in low and middle income countries, it's also in developed countries. So our, our whole early childhood curriculum needs to be more uh, gender neutral. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for um, one more um, sort of, you know, related set of questions that I want to direct to Dana um, and um, and Nirmala and really anybody, any of the panelists. Um, there were a couple of questions from the audience. One um, sort of kind of helicoptering up a bit again. It, one was, what would you do to scale up gender and early childhood education initiatives um, and that agenda in the context in which you work? Um, and then another, was um, in the context of limited resources and infrastructure. So for example, in rural areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, what innovative approaches or technologies can be harnessed to improve access to quality early childhood education and healthcare services for children? So this kind of this question of, you know, of scale and, and, and replication and um, whether you have, you know, seen any um great examples that you, you might want to want to share um with the audience would be great um do you want to questions I, I don't know if others I, I did want to can I touch very quickly on the last topic about fathers first um so so one thing I uh I alluded to in my remarks was that um when uh 
adults transition into parenthood, um, they're shifting their identities. And there's some research to suggest that means that they're open to thinking very differently about other things as well. And so there have been some um, highly successful programs working with new parents um, it, to have um, structured conversations around gender and how that shows up in their lives and to begin to shift um, uh, perceptions about gender norms um, and beliefs in ways that I, I think can be more powerful perhaps than at other than at other moments in people's lives. And so um, so I think this um, engaging fathers um, when they become fathers um, is potentially a, 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 a really powerful vehicle for beginning to shift some of those gender norms. So I just wanted to, to bring in that other dimension on the on the fatherhood point. Um, in terms of scale, I think there are there certainly are a number of organizations um, trying to crack that and say how can we um, reach a lot of parents, for example, with more resources around what to do with young children and how to actually you know build into everyday moments opportunities um, for for children to engage and learn. So there's organizations like Dost in India that have um, you know developed simple. Um, uh, systems where parents get phone calls um, with suggested activities um, and things that are, are you know, easy to deliver that they've now are also experimenting partnerships with Anganwadi centers to, to reach more parents. And so um, I think in systems like India, where there are existing structures like on Anganwadi centers, there are, there are opportunities to scale new things and to, as Arundam said, to really strengthen um, the education components of what's being delivered in those systems. I think it's a little tougher in other contexts where um, there are not yet government investments in large scale um, early childhood programs. Um, I think that's um, a little bit tougher to think about scale. Um, I think some are thinking about how do you reach um, uh, the, the families with the lowest socioeconomic status and really target um, investments um, for, for those families in terms of, for example, at home support for parenting um, and those sorts of things. And so that's you know another approach is to say in contexts where there's not widespread um, availability of these opportunities, how do we um, think about the equity components that Nirmala was talking about before and really target support for, for families who need it the most. Um, uh, but I think also fundamentally, uh, you know, making the case for more investments in the early years is also important because it, there are um, lots of countries still where um, preschool access is very low. Just final point. I just want to cut, touch the technology part that you mentioned, Nicole. Technology, very, very important. And it it really can help us develop the infrastructure to monitor uh use of early childhood uh, systems you know we are we have very poor data generally okay um on uh you know how many children attend preschool in low and middle income countries uh because we have uh, unregulated uh non-state actors we really don't know you know we know how many kids will go to the Anganwadi but really it's very hard even in a country like India to know how many kids are going to private preschools right you you have the NFHA state data which um, is nationally representative so technology one can help in many many ways one is the way that Dana was saying you know providing services uh you you know uh text for baby kind of programs encouraging parents to stimulate their children etc cetera, etc cetera. so to deliver interventions it's fabulous but technology can also help us in monitoring because the SDGs require us to monitor right as well so I think technology is our friend and we need to use it the right way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nirmala. I'm just sort of shocked to see the time. Um, and I see where we are at time. So I, I, what a great set of uh, concepts and hopeful um, notes to end on. Um, please join me, everybody, in thanking our amazing, amazing speakers. Um, this has been a truly inspiring 
um, panel, Nirmala, Samyukta, Arundam, Dana, thank you all so much. Um, and big thanks um, also to the audience for your participation and really thought provoking questions. Um, we could go on talking about this all day. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and drop some resources in the chat, some of the things that the panelists mentioned. Um, and please um, check out um, Pratham's website, um, Pratham usa.org, um, join the eager community, um, eagerresource.org, um, and to the eager digest. Um, and we look forward very much to continuing discussions on gender equity and education. Um, thank you again, everybody. Thanks panelists and speakers and um, see you all again very soon. Thank you.